COVID-19 is complex. It can affect the nervous system, leading to language disorders, strokes and seizures. Scientists are still trying to understand why. 75% of people hospitalized with the virus continue to suffer from secondary symptoms at least six months after they recover. Many find it hard to function in their daily lives. Researchers hope understanding COVID's impact on the brain could pave a way for treatment. India is breathing a sigh of relief with daily infections falling, but the havoc from the second wave is fresh in people's minds and many patients are still struggling with the knock-on effects of COVID. DW's Manira Chowdhury met Deepak Agarwal from Delhi. After losing 25 kilos and still very weak, Deepak is now slowly trying to get back to a state of normalcy and the life he had before it was disrupted by a severe COVID-19 infection. The only issue which came to my mind is at the age of 60, whether I will be able to win upon this battle or not. After struggling initially, Deepak managed to get admitted to a hospital when his workplace intervened. Of the 50 days he spent there, 40 were spent in the intensive care unit. Worst thing which happened is, at the end of a 10th or 12th day, my legs, I, I found that my legs are not working. They are, they are not the part of my body. I was not able to cope up with the oxygen mask, what they have put. And I was really feeling helpless. I said, there is no point in living now because I can't cope up with this pressure. I left a message to my one of my eldest cousin brother that I am not going to survive. I think tomorrow is going to be my last day. Each day he could hear people screaming with pain and discomfort. And each day he saw someone dying. Deepak knew he was fighting this infection at a time when the entire city was struggling hard to cope with it. It was his two children, he says, who gave him the courage he needed. The first feeling that was there with me 24-7 was the fear. Fear of losing him. You want to return back to normal. You just want to see those four members of your family together on the dining table. Kanika says the experience with their father and the sights they saw at the hospital have made all of them stronger as a family. The post-COVID uh, time is more tougher than the COVID time. I'm really finding it very difficult to cope up with me, the recovery time, because it's already one month. It's already one month. I'm not able to walk even the 10th step now. So it's a, you know, what doctors are telling, it will take six months. One small, slow step at a time. He is trying to move towards full recovery. But with every task still a challenge, he knows it will take a long time. Camilla Miskoviak is a professor of cognitive neuropsychiatry and joins us from Copenhagen University Hospital. Patients like the one in our report can suffer from cognitive impairment half a year after recovering from COVID. How often does that actually occur though? Because the general number we found was 75%, which sounds extremely high. This is a very good question. Um, so studies so far uh, show quite varying results. Uh, we've conducted a study at University Hospital in Copenhagen uh, where we found that 65% of people who've been hospitalized with COVID continue to show cognitive difficulties four months after their hospital discharge. Um, this was quite a small study, but still it uh, is consistent with the other studies in the field. So generally studies show that over half of patients who've been hospitalized continue to show cognitive impairments after their recovery. And I guess you won't have that much data on this, but it's worth asking how much longer could that sort of thing go on for for these patients? So we don't know yet because it's a very new illness and we've only started uh, recently to study the long-term effects of COVID on cognition. Um, so uh, based on our study and also other studies in the field that show quite uh, consistent findings, um, we, we think that uh, at least up to six months uh, that, that, that these cognitive impairments last up to six months. But we currently uh, conducted follow-up studies of the same patients uh, for one year after they got discharged. And I know that other research groups are doing the same. So hopefully we can give a better answer to that very soon. What sort of other patterns are evident in, in patients in, in your studies? 
So regarding the patterns of uh, cognitive impairments, uh, we have found, and this is also quite consistent with other studies in the field, uh, we found that it's mainly verbal memory, so the ability to remember words, as well as concentration and planning abilities um, that seem to be affected. Now, it's worth noting that uh, the cognitive uh, functions after COVID are highly variable, and actually there is a large proportion of people who don't have any uh, cognitive impairments after they've recovered from COVID. Uh, so our findings only, um, uh, you know, they, they're only representative of people who've been hospitalized. Um, and even in these people, uh, one third or up to one half or at least one third I ha have no cognitive uh, difficulties. But, but those who have cognitive difficulties, they do have uh, memory problems, concentration difficulties, planning difficulties. And this is, uh, if we look at the brain, uh, this is mainly related to the frontal lobe and the hippocampus, um, where the hippocampus is a structure in the brain that is really, uh, really important for memory formation um, and is also very sensitive to oxygen starvation. What, so this what, could be um, a biological reason uh, why we, for, for these uh, difficulties that we see in these uh, aspects of, of cognition. And, and what are the problems associated with, with these impairments? So um, again, uh, this is something that we're only just beginning to study. Um, and in our study, we found that, that the cognitive impairments uh, were related to greater degree of anxiety and depression, um, and also to problems with uh, functioning at work um, and also poorer quality of life. But we don't really know what the direction of, of these uh, relations, uh, what the direction is. So it could be on one hand that depression uh, is causing the cognitive problems. We know that from, from for example, patients uh, who have depression, that they also have cognitive problems. Um, so those symptoms can cause cognitive problems. On the other hand, we also know that if you have cognitive difficulties and difficulties with functioning in your daily life, then this can also cause stress and depression and anxiety. So we don't really know what the direction of this, uh, if, of, of this relation is or this association, just that they seem to coexist um, and also influence each other. And what do we know about the prevalence uh, of these types of complications uh, of acute illness from COVID? So the prevalence of, of cognitive impairments uh, differs across studies. So we've conducted studies in, in uh, this study in, uh, in hospitalized uh, people, so the more severe cases, um, and these findings are uh, not really um, applicable to a broader category of people who've had COVID. Uh, we know from several studies that uh, the severity of illness seems to uh, be related to a greater risk of long-term cognitive impairments, uh, so that people with milder illnesses uh, seem to not be at, at risk uh, so much for, for these kind of complications. Lastly, but definitely not least, what, what sort of therapies or countermeasures can be taken? This is the million dollar question and we are all uh, wanting to study this. Um, so I'm not aware of any uh, treatment that has been shown to be effective yet based on research, but um, we are currently looking into this. There are several research groups that are investigating this. And also until then, until we have um, uh, an evidence-based treatment for cognitive impairments uh, in these patients, um, Clinical psychologists uh, are applying techniques from other diseases. So, for example, traumatic brain injury, uh, where people also have cognitive problems. So they use, for example, cognitive rehabilitation techniques and so on. So we will just have to wait and, and see whether these uh, methods are also effective for cognitive impairments after COVID. Camilla Miskoviak, Copenhagen University Hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you. And here's a question I've been asking myself about immunizing as I had no reaction from either of my shots. Over to Derek Williams. Does not having any side effects after vaccination mean you have a weak immune system? This is a great question because it's about much more than the immune system. It's also about the, the psychology of immunization, which I've experienced in an up close and personal way. Um, I had zero side effects after either dose of my messenger RNA vaccine. Um, my arm didn't even really hurt. Uh, close family members, on the other hand, were 
were pretty uncomfortable afterwards with, with chills and fever and, and headaches and, and fatigue, really the whole nine yards. They moaned about the side effects, of course, but they were actually almost happy to feel as lousy as they did because for them, it meant the vaccine was working and they were kind of concerned for me and, and maybe even felt slightly superior because I didn't have any. Um, after bracing myself for the worst, I admit that I felt a little let down and, and maybe, maybe even a little bit worried that, that somehow my immune system was getting something wrong. But all the experts say I shouldn't worry. The truth is, we don't really know why some immune systems go into overdrive briefly after vaccination and others just seem to kind of coast through it. Um, the interactions between all of the different elements of the immune system are, are so convoluted that, that immunologists compare it vividly to, to a ball of spaghetti. But as far as we can tell, experiencing powerful side effects after vaccination is mostly about how your own personal immune system works rather than about how effective the vaccine is. Um, as a broad rule of thumb, uh, women and younger people experience side effects more often than, than men and elderly people do. And, and more people have them after the second shot than after the first. But if, like me, you didn't feel a thing afterwards, don't sweat it. Um, all the evidence we have indicates strongly that you're just as well protected as someone who had a miserable couple of days. Thank you, Derek. Now I'm feeling better. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and see you again soon.